الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين محمد وآله الطاهرين سواء الله الله Sometime back, a few weeks back, telling him that I'm going to be visiting um, Dearborn and Detroit, and then I said that you know it's good for us to meet up, inshallah. And so he was kind enough to like organize this event and give me a chance to inshallah meet with the um, mu'minin. And he suggest, suggested that there's uh, people here who are interested in learning about the the hawza. And, um, and I was thinking, what what more can I add? Given that you have Sheikh Radwan here, who himself is a graduate of the hawza, um, but I guess he was saying that maybe hearing things from a different perspective and maybe getting a more fresher current perspective because um, obviously things change over the years and things develop and grow and so getting an idea of what's going on um, currently might be of benefit to people. Um, so I was intending to uh, speak about uh, a few topics related to that. Just briefly I wanted to mention why somebody would go for the Hausa and then um, when going there what are some things to keep in mind both in terms of like what somebody should do and what are some things they should avoid doing. Um, but I was assuming that I would be speaking to people who are interested in going for the Hausa. Um, so is that the case? Are there some people present? If not, then we can discuss something else. You know what I mean? Like, um, that would be good? Okay. Right. Okay. So, so I don't know if... Uh, I think people are more interested in just getting some ideas because I know there are people who want to go or they know people who want to go. Okay. So essentially, I mean, I think there's a lot of questions, maybe if you recollect some of the things that came to your mind. Okay. Uh, when you dis wanted to go or maybe ask some people, maybe you can help, you know, relay that information to us financially, traveling, okay. what are accommodations, right. what do people study, right. uh, what times are off. Okay. Uh, I mean, I'm sure you can relate uh, that way. Okay, okay. Okay, so in terms of the logistics and like those detailed questions of how things work, um, I'd rather than addressing those, like, I'd just leave that open to question and answer. If people want to find out about something they really need to know either for themselves or they want to share that with somebody else about logistics, then inshallah, we, we can cover that after. Um, I just say a few words. So let me just say a few words about sort of the mindset of why somebody, of what somebody should have or might they, what they might have when going to the Hausa. And then I'll stop, and then people want to ask more about that, or they want to talk about logistics, we can talk about that. I just want to mention from now that um, there's a website called studyinqum.com. Um, studyinqum.com. And, and uh, it's an effort of a few people um, who have sort of been over the years just compiling different information about studying in Qum. So basically, you know, all that stuff that you mentioned about you know, expenses, and there's a budget there of how much it costs to live there, you know, that we took, and um, things about housing and different schools that are there, different options, what to do with ch children, um, special women's issues like having to deal with like, you know, um, women's houses, etc. So you can go and check it out, inshallah, um, and uh, that, sh that should answer a lot of the logistic questions. Some people are going to the Hausa um, because they, are they don't have anything else to do. It's like, kind of like they're lost, right? They're looking for something it's like there's something in them that's like pushing them and they're like, okay, let me try this right here. You know, like I've tried other things, right? I went to university maybe, I went to, you know, different schooling. I, I don't have anything to do now. Let me go and try this thing right here, right? Some people um, are going and they're treating it like a university experience. It's like, okay, I need to go and learn this information and then um, just like, and study there. Like I need to go get another degree, all right? Um, some people are going and um, they're going because the, the main purpose is that they want to help other people, right? They're going because, and I've heard this, like somebody told me like, I'm going, I'm going to study for two years and I will go back and be a scholar and lead the people, right? It's like the mindset is purely focused on other people, right? So sometimes they don't, people go, they don't really have a, a pure, just to summarize that, they don't have a pure, a, a, a real clear goal. And it's just kind of like they're going, you know, it's just like, let me go try this out. And other times it's going and it's an, a very academic sort of goal. And the, sec and the third time it's, it's very much like a service oriented goal. It's like, let me go and then serve the other people. But what should the goal be? Um, in my humble opinion, this goes, it ties, it ties back to what is the goal for why we're here? What are we created for? 
Right? If we look at the message of the Quran and the message from the Ahadith um, of the Ahlul Bayt, um, the, just to summarize, you know, this message or part of it at least, you know, is that we were created for a purpose, which is to become um, true uh, slaves of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and um, practice abudiyah and uh, servitude in all aspects of our lives. And in doing so, we are allowing ourselves to receive the special mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which comes in the form of knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? The, the, the special knowledge of Allah. Meaning, in, in a simple expression, we have been created to worship. And as Imam uh, Imam Ali Muslim have said, that, that worshiping is equivalent or the same, or an explanation of that is to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to gain ma'rifah of Allah, right? So, the quest is one of gaining knowledge, the purpose in life, it's the purpose, we're, you're here to gain knowledge of Allah through worshipping Him, right, and gain knowledge of what we need in order to do to worship Him and then through worshipping gain more knowledge of Him. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a quest, right? So somebody going to the Hawza should have this in mind, which is that I'm going to gain knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as you know, as we all know, knowledge is of two types. One of them is a knowledge which is an acquired knowledge, and which involves like learning things, like learning, um, you know, different di disciplines and, and keeping them in our mind, memorizing them, studying them. Um, and there's another knowledge, which is the knowledge which is a, a direct experiential, a presential knowledge. Okay, and the, the goal of, of life is to gain that immediate presential knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All right, it's, it's something that goes beyond just facts and figures. Like we study about Allah in our Sunday schools, we study about Him um, when we read books. But these are just, um, this is just a knowledge which is, you know, in our mind and it's something that we can explain to others but it's, it's not something that we necessarily feel within our hearts. The goal is to translate that knowledge into, into the heart and to become aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in an intimate, presential way. And for that knowledge to be increasing as we go along in our, in our lives, through our actions, through our servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, given that that's inshallah clear, now what is going to the hawza about? Going to the Hawza um, is, should, should be tied to this in a direct way, meaning that I want to achieve the purpose of my life and I'm going to the Hawza in order to attain that. So what is the Hawza going to give me? Number one is that if I want to be able to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I have to know how I should serve Him. Very simple. What, what do I need to do? Okay, how do I serve? How does Allah want me to serve Him? And that is divided into three categories. We have the Ahkam. We have the aqaid, and we, uh, the aqidah, and we have the akhlaq. Three categories of knowledge. We need to find out what is our responsibility when it comes to these three categories. Sometimes it's difficult to find that. It, it, it is difficult to find that outside of, of the hawza because of language barriers, because of lack, lack of access to scholars. So I'm going to go there in order to gain that knowledge in a very practical way. What is it? What's the knowledge I need to know in order to apply to myself so I can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Number one. Number two is... Okay, now that I am, now that I have um, attained this basic set of knowledge, I'm acting upon it, right? Now I want to further my servitude to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. I want to like, you know, to go beyond just this basic level, and I want to go even more and more along this journey of getting knowledge of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, of serving Him, which is the path of servitude, which is the path of, um, it's in other terminology, it's, because it's the path of spirituality, it's the path of irfan, right? All these. The path of getting close to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. All of these are synonyms, and they all mean the same thing. It's a path, a practical path of action to take me close to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So that I can get that from the Hausa as well too. What I'm saying is that the 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 Hausa experience is an experience of not only learning, okay, but it's a it's a it's an experience of development, of self development, and somebody who goes to the Hausa, first of all, without any goal in mind, right, then it's problematic because they'll get there, they won't be sure, they won't, it'll be very unclear why they're doing what they're doing. And oftentimes they'll turn, up, turn right back around and go back home. All right? Somebody who goes with the, in, in, the intention of just, of just um, treating it like another university experience, well, they're missing the whole point because this is not a university. Here I'm going and it's a totally different thing. Here I'm trying to get that knowledge which is going to help me fulfill my obligation to God. And I'm getting knowledge of God and I'm finding people there who are qualified teachers of spirituality who are going to assist me in this as well too. Because after all, we in this world, um, this world is created in a way that if I want to learn anything, if I want to, if I want to go in, and excel in any field, then yeah, I can do it myself, but how far can I go? Right? And I won't ever be perfect. 
the only way of really being perfect is by taking a teacher. So if somebody goes to, to Qum, um, what they are doing is they're allowing themselves to find um, a guide who is going to be able to guide them um, down the path and help them. Not that the guide is doing anything but that. I mean, the guide's role is just to help them along the path of, that the Ahlul Bayt have set forth. But assuming that the guide is, is authentic and is authorized and you know, they're gonna, it's going to be a great help to them as they're marching down this path towards um, spirituality and perfection and knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and then as far as the third thing is concerned, where somebody goes just to serve Allah, just to serve other people, this is a mistake as well too. This is not looking at it in a, in a holistic perspective because we are told, if you look at the Quranic message, the Quranic message is that, A'udhu Billahi Min Shaitan Rajim, this is Surah, Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse number 105. Um, Allah SWT says, Ya yuhladina amanu, qu, uh, uh, alaykum anfusakum. Alaykum anfusakum. Right? Uh, be aware and, and be concerned with yourselves. Right? This is the primary responsibility is that we have to God is for ourselves. So if we go and our only expectation is to go and help other people, um, then we're, we're missing the, the point. The point is ourselves. So then the question might come up, how does helping oneself, does that mean that Islam... Islam. Islam is a selfish religion that we're supposed to not worry about other people at all right? How does that, how does that reconcile with alaykum um, and Anybody have any idea? How, how would you reconcile these two? That on one hand we're supposed to be worried about ourselves on the other hand we want to help other people How do we reconcile these two? Any, any ideas? You can't help others like the Arabic saying says Someone who doesn't have something cannot give it to others Okay So you have to have Gain that, whatever, okay. So this is a good, uh, this is a good lo uh, level, first level of understanding that that if I want to help other people, I have to have something to be able to help them with, and so therefore I'm going. But that still doesn't um, answer the main issue here, which is that somebody can go to the hausa, and the intention is purely other people. So what they're doing is they're learning whatever they need to do in order learn in order to help other people. All right. Uh, but that's not answering the question because we're told in the Quran, alaykum and fusakum, right? That you have to worry about yourselves, right? So how does this, how does this, how do we reconcile the two? Let me throw something out there. This is not my, not my, my understanding of this. is from Allah Taala. He's explaining this verse in, in, in Al Mizan. He says that um, that the way that there, he says that there might be a, a conflict. Some people might see that there's a conflict between this and between the verses of the Quran, which tell us. That you should do Amr bil ma'aruf and nahi anil munkar. You should go to people and, and spread goodness to them, teach them about the righteous, uh, the, the, right, the truth and the right and tawheed and these things. Um, go, give goodness to other people and prevent them from doing evil. Show them on the right way, guide them to the right path. He says that apparently some people might say that there's a conflict between that and between this verse which says that you should worry about yourselves. He says that the way to resolve that is that somebody who is Sir is going to other people and guiding them actually that what they're doing is they're actually doing something for themselves right so her, helping other people should not fall outside of helping ourselves right because why because when we're helping other people actually um, first and foremost we're seeing okay is this a responsibility that God has put on me to help other people in some cases it's yes some cases it's no for example if I don't have what it takes to help other people there's no way I can go and help them. In that case, it's not my responsibility. But if it's a responsibility, then I'm going and helping them, I'm spreading the knowledge to them because of God's duty. God has made it a duty for me. And therefore, I'm serving God by serving the other people. So in essence, I'm never going outside of myself. I'm always doing whatever I need to do in front of God. It's never that I'm worrying about other people exclusively and not worrying about how myself and my responsibility in front of God um, comes into the picture. And so if we understand this, it's a deep point, I hope inshallah brothers and sisters uh, grasped it, I'm sure they, they did. Um, if we understand this, then that changes our focus. Now, whatever we do in the hawza, it's, it's about ourselves, it's about improving ourselves, gaining knowledge, uh, achieving that purpose of, of getting close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then when it becomes our responsibility to share with other people, then if, it's, if that's what God wants us to do, that's our responsibility, then for the sake of God, we're going to do it. It's a different experience, a different mindset. You see, uh, sometimes people ask me, they, they say, okay, like, um, you know, are you going to go and give lectures when you get, to, this is in the first couple of years, are you going to go and give lectures, right? Uh, the right answer isn't that, oh, yeah, I feel like doing it, or I don't feel like doing it. It's that, okay, is it my responsibility? Is God, if God wants me to do it, then I'll do it. 
Right? Okay, are you going to wear the, the dress of, the, of an Islamic scholar? Well, it's not about a, a personal thing. Right? If God wants me to do it, then you know, that's what I have to do. Because after all, I'm there. It's fully about God and me and that, that relationship. The more that, it, it, at various times, it may be the case that I have to go and serve other people as well too. But that be, that's a secondary thing in the sense that it doesn't become my primary goal. Um, that will change somebody's experience in the Hawza dramatically because if somebody just worries about other people, then their studies will change, like their, the things that they do will change, the amount of time they spend on tabligh will change, um, their balance will change. Um, it's, it, it, it becomes a different sort of experience. And also, um, I believe that the purpose of the Hawza is for some, to train some, an individual to become a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so then he or she can then serve other people. Okay, now I've said um, a couple of points right now about uh, you know, what it, somebody should do when they're going to serve, when they're going to the Hawza and how that fits in with serving other people. I just want to mention one or two more points. Um, one point is that um, when it comes to the way somebody should study in the Hawza, what should be the, what should be the way that they study? Um, somebody who goes to the Hawza, my, my personal belief is that, um, that there's two different basically tracks that somebody can, can take. Somebody can, somebody can go and go for like a one to two year sort of personal quest type of thing, which is they're going to like find out the purpose of, you know, like why they're here in this world, get exposure to Farsi, get that experience of living in the Islamic Republic, you know, in that environment and be with mu'minin, recite jama'ah prayers, etc. Be in touch with some of these teachers, get, um, sort of program, get a program of spirituality for themselves that they can continue when they come back home. This is one option. The other option is that somebody will go and go the full route and aim to like, um, learn studies in a comprehensive sort of way because they've determined that this is something that's necessary. Um, it's a profession, it becomes a profession for them. This is what they're going to do in their lives. And this is a more long-term sort of thing. Um, Average, average is like, you know, say eight to ten years, right? This is average. Now, of course, there can be cases, cases where people get it done in less time, where it could take more time, but average is this amount of time. And this needs to be, I mean, we have to understand that what we're going for is serious knowledge, right? Um, we, the scholars of the Ahlul Bayt, alayhi wa sallam, um, scholars of the school, uh, Shia scholars are different than, say, scholars of other religions and other schools of thought. Among the Sunnis, for example, um, if you've memorized the Qur'an, you can quote a few hadith, then usually that gives you qualifications to do a lot of stuff, right? If you have good Arabic and that type of thing. But what we're after is something a little bit more sophisticated, right? It's not just about like, you know, being able to like, you know, do the miswak and like, I don't know, like, you know, say a few things in Arabic, right? I mean, the responsibilities that Shia scholars have is much more, um, you know, it's much, it's, it's much more serious, it's more heavy. Um, what we're after, my brothers and sisters, is creating people who can become Islamic decision makers and who can be who can be guides to the people all right and what that what that means is that we are in the society we have we need to guide our communities in a way that it goes beyond just putting together jama'a prayers and having a sunday school and teaching quran although those things are very important what we need to do is actually make decisions on the basis of ilm right for how to engage with the society and how to like deal with issues like, let me give you some examples, like a couple examples. One of them is like, for example, should we celebrate Halloween? Or should we not celebrate Halloween? Okay? Now, everyone can have an opinion on this issue. You can say that, okay, it's a pagan holiday, right? Um, it involves like gluttony and materialism. Or you can say that, what do you mean? It involves charity, right? You're going, people are coming to you, you're giving them, that's charity. It's a great way of doing da'wah to people. Right? And, or people can say, it's halal p pleasure, why, aren't, why are you trying to prevent people from having a good time? Our kids enjoy eating the candy. There's a lot of opinions that you can express on it. But what is the right decision? What is the right answer? It's not an easy thing. Right? It requires a, an expert to come and look at all the different things and make a, make a decision on it. Right? Let, me give you no, let me give you another example. Um, uh, we have a problem right now where we have a lot of young people who want to get married, but they cannot find spouses who... You know, they're there, but they just can't find them. So we want to put them together. We want to hook them up. Right? How do we do that in the best way possible? Right? People have come up with various solutions around the country. Like, for example, in one place, they basically had like speed dating sort of thing. Like, they came together and like, it's like, okay, meet with this person five minutes, then five minutes, five minutes. Okay? Or another place, they had this idea that let's go and have a conference and have the guys and the girls and let them, you know, see each other and interact. And... You know, afterwards they can go out for coffee or something like that. I don't know if you heard about this, but you know, it, it happens, right? Um, it, 
these are solutions, right? They're solutions, but is this the Islamic solution to the problem, right? We want to set up an Islamic school, an Islamic school, right? Okay, so we, do we put a Muslim name on it? We have an Islamic class taught there. We have a dress code and we have Salatul Jama'ah. Are we done? Is that all we need for an Islamic school? That becomes a school where there's Muslims who attend. But that's not necessarily an Islamic school. Islamic school is something, it's a different beast altogether. So what I'm saying is that we have a need of people who can go and be, get deep knowledge of Islam, come back and be Islamic decision makers, and then also be guides to people because people are hungry for spirituality. We need to give solutions to people. Right now, um, the, people have told me this, that they've gone to, for example, they, they get inspired in Laylatul Qadr to become get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they go to um, like a, a scholar, right? And they ask him, what can we do? Give us something more, give us something, right? We need something, right? And the scholar at that point needs to have a good answer for them, right? Needs to be able to take them to the further level, right? We need to start thinking of our scholars in a different light. A scholar isn't just there so I can get an istikhara or I can ask him once in a while, okay, Maulana, um, what do I, how, do I, uh, how do I pray in this particular circumstance when I'm, when I'm, on, a, when I'm on a plane, right? Um, we need to think of our scholars in a more wider capacity, right? Oh, oh Maulana, I'm, I'm not feeling that pleasure in worship that I should be feeling. Can you please guide me? What's my problem, right? Um, Maulana, like, um, I want to start out my marital relationship on the right foot. Please give me practical points that I can put into practice when it comes to my marriage that will make sure, ensure that it's going to be successful. Right? These are serious things that need serious study. And so therefore I would encourage those brothers and sisters who are thinking about going, um, if, if this is their responsibility, um, we have a great need of people becoming serious scholars, of taking this, their studies very seriously. Inshallah, being there for the long term, and then that's, that's the way they can be of a great asset to the communities, inshallah. Um, the final point I want to mention, and then inshallah open it up, is that um, uh, in my personal experience, I have to say that, um, that being in the Hawza has been the greatest gift and the greatest blessing that I could possibly have been given, that I know of. Um, I, I personally believe that Qum is... Um, there's, there's, there's a piece of paradise in Qum and in the Haram there, and and just being there, like it's such a blessing. I can't explain how much I prize that blessing. I just pray that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala doesn't <laughs> take me to account for like you know short changing this blessing and not doing what's necessary for it. And just to be in the presence of of the Haram and of of teachers who are walking and talking models of the Ahlul Bayt alayhi wasalam, is a blessing that cannot be described. But having said that, I, w- I want to say to the brothers and sisters who are thinking about going that being in Qum is not. Um, necessarily the most rosy of experiences and we shouldn't have any false images in mind it can be very difficult to be in Qum and we have to face the reality of the situation imagine okay uh, imagine that it was if you go into Qum everything is fine and dandy and everything just works out for you all right and you you walk in and somebody comes to you and say okay I'm gonna take here's your classes and and you have like the best teachers and and here's your home and here's a stipend and here's here's a car for you a taxi for whenever you want you can call them up and you know, here's your food coming to you. I mean, if it was like that, then everyone would go there, right? Right? And if everyone were to go there, we'd have problems, right? Because then it would be hard to distinguish between who's there for the right reason, who's there for the wrong reasons, right? So that's part of it. Another part of it is that, um, is that you know, Allah SWT tests us in various ways. And if we're going to the Hawza to attain perfection for ourselves, and then inshallah, in that way, become a light and beacon for others, then we have to understand that part of becoming a perfect person is being tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And sometimes we're tested by the environment we live in. And this is okay, this is okay. It doesn't mean that just because we're being tested that, oh, uh, the Hawza is bad, or that Qum is bad, or that Iran is bad, or something like that. No, that's part of being there, right? It's an Islamic republic, and it's an Islamic country. And alhamdulillah, there are gems who are lived there. If it weren't for the gems, um, and these people who are, honestly, like I said, uh, uh, the practical walking, talking models of the Ahlul Bayt Muslim, then I certainly would have left a long time ago, personally. But at the same time, you have people who aren't perfect as well too, right? And it's, it's, you have to deal with them as well, right? And they're challenged, right? They have issues. Sometimes it's a matter of them just being um, gruff and like, you know, just on the surface level. And because you don't speak Farsi well at the beginning, then you think that they're mean to you. No, that's just the way that they are, right? Sometimes, no, they're on, honestly like, you know, people who are corrupt and, and they're, they're rotten at the core. Well, that doesn't mean that we have to leave Qum as a result, right? 
Um, like just let me share with you one, one incident, right? This happens to everyone who goes there. When you go there first, right? Um, you know, we in America, right? We're used to like closing our car doors and like pushing it shut, right? And we don't think about it. We, whenever we leave the car, we close it and we, we put some pressure there as well too, right? The cars in Iran, if you ever go there, it's funny. Like the cars, um, they're built in such a way that if you put the same amount of pressure when you're closing the door there that you do here, then it makes a big bang, okay? And they're built in such a way that if you bang it too many times, then that rubber lining sort of falls away and then it costs the driver money, right? So the first few days, inevitably, what happens is you'll close the door and then the guy will yell at you in like, in like Farsi and be like, rah, 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 right? and then you're like, oh my God, I didn't close the door properly. So you open the door and you'll <laughs> shut it even, like even more pressure. You're like, bang, right? And then he'll get even more upset at you. And then you're like, you don't know what you're doing, right? And you know, this can be a, uh, the reason is because he did, you know, the first time you shouldn't have shut it with so much pressure. So this can be a very upsetting thing for somebody to be yelled at by taxi drivers. And then uh, that's just an example of different things will happen, right? But that's okay, right? That's part of being in that culture. And it's something to laugh, laugh about really, right? Um, one of the things we're told in hadith is that um, you know, like um, glad tidings and be to the be one, be to the one who is worried about the, who, who is busy worried about himself, such that he's not pre preoccupied with the faults of other people. He sees himself as somebody who has faults. We should come to come with that intention of wanting to fix ourselves. Our responsibility isn't to fix the people around us, right? That's not that our responsibility is to f fix ourselves, and then you know, inshallah one day we'll be able to help other people as well too. And even then, it's not the people who are there. There's other people who are, it doesn't fall into our lap, right? And how much can we do with our, our broken Farsi and, you know, being from a different culture? Um, at least at the first few years. We have to go, our, our task is something else, right? Um, that being said, again, um, it, it's, not, it's not always easy. And in fact, somebody who's going should expect to face some difficulties. And they should only go if they're sure that they can deal with these things. Let me just th give a list of these and inshallah we'll end up. Number one is that it's difficult to live in a third world country. Um, the material, uh, you know, it's just, uh, the material, uh, from a material perspective, it's difficult, right? Everything isn't available at your fingertips. You don't have Walmarts, okay? You don't have, I don't know what you have, your Targets, Walmarts, right? You don't have your big grocery stores, right? And you have to sacrifice on some of the stuff. Like, all, if you like Doritos or Cheetos, they have Cheetos there, but it's of a different, like, this is say, like, they have, like, a tenth of the weight of the Cheetos here or something like that. So if you're really into these, these material comforts, then you have to think twice and see, how much can you do with, right? Um, another thing is it's expensive to live there. It used to be cheap and now it's expensive. Financially speaking, it's going to be a, a, a stress. Another thing is that, a third thing is that not everything is going to be handed to you on a silver platter. Um, it's not going to be like university here where you just sign up for your classes and then you're set. You can do that, but you're not going to get what you need. You have to work, you have to work at getting your classes set up, but experience has shown that those who are willing to work hard, they can get what they need. And alhamdulillah, there are, ample resources available for those who show the aptitude. There's no problem. Once they see that somebody's serious and they have a mission and they're, com they're keen on that, then they'd respond. But we shouldn't go there and expecting that, okay, there's a special program here for a, a Western student who has graduated from college and it, it needs to learn about those things particular to the, those who are in the West and needs to be challenged. I mean, no, there's some patience involved. Uh, patience is a very important thing when studying in Hausa um, as part of the developmental process. Another thing is that we need to keep in mind is that we shouldn't expect quick results, right? It's about slow and steady progress. There's a reason why it takes so long to be in the Hausa. And part of it has to do with becoming Hausawi, becoming, getting the culture of the Hausa. We, when we go there, we have a lot of demons in our, in our hearts and our minds that need to be exercised by the, by the culture that we're in. There's a lot of idols that we don't realize we bow to, but we have and they need to be broken down one by one. All right? And that can only happen by being in that environment and being there for a while. So we shouldn't expect quick results. Yes, there, you can go and study the same books on your own, listening to cassettes, and you can get it done in half the time. All right? But is that the goal? Right? There's something else we're after. Remember that the goal is something more than just learning that information. So it's about patience, going there for the long term. And then and another, la the last point I mentioned is that one of the other tests and challenges that we need to face is that somebody who goes to the Hausa and is able to stick it out for like, let's say, three years or more, um, they become a th a, a somebody who's a bit like a rock star, okay, in the sense that because there's so few people who are in the Hausa and there's so much need that, oh, okay, it could be like, oh, this brother's in the Hausa, okay, you know, like this is, it's become something. And this can be a major test for people. Right? And there's been people who have failed this test miserably because as soon as you got, start getting attention, 
then your soul is like, oh, you know, like I am something, right? So keeping that intention sincere, doing things for Allah, not for the people, right? Not stepping outside of our capabilities, right? Being able to say, I don't know when I don't know. Um, and, and being able to say that, you know what? Yes, this is something good to do, but it's not my position to go and do that right now. There's other things that are more important for me to do right now. It's very important. It's sometimes very attractive to study things like theoretical irfan and be able to talk about fana fillah and all these great wonderful things. But my responsibility might be that I need to go and study the rules of parturition and menstruation and, and these type of things, right? Because this is more important for me right now. Right? And this is very important, right? Um, it's the, the test is very great, right? Because the more blessings that there are, it seems like the test is more great as well too. It's very easy to slip, right? But knowing this and, and having this in mind before we go in will help us inshallah, right? Um, even if somebody goes after one year, um, there'll be some expectations on him or her that they should be different, right? Right? It, like the same way that I was, something must have changed, right? So the way that somebody conducts himself um, has to reflect that. This is a part of the challenge that's there, is that we have to be willing to accept that, that things are going to change for us. Um, the nafs has to be controlled. And that goes, part, that, that, that goes back to making sure that we have, we're in contact with teachers who are um, authorized and, you know, um, who can help us in this regard and give us instructions from the Ahlul Bayt to keep ourselves in check. So I pray that inshallah Allah, uh, Allah guides us um, to do what is our responsibility and if it is our responsibility to go to the Hawza that we can do it in the best way possible and inshallah um, do it in a way that's useful for ourselves and to the cause of the Ahlul Bayt and that we can see ourselves in whatever capacity we are, we're in whether we're here or whether we're there somehow we are serving the cause of the Ahlul Bayt by doing our responsibilities to ourselves first and foremost, and then to our families, and then to our communities at large. Brother's saying that, uh, on one hand, you, we're, saying that, uh, we're, we're saying that you have to learn knowledge by going to the books and, and reading the books and gaining knowledge that way. For example, by going to the Hawza and doing that. On the other hand, we're told that true knowledge is a light uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala casts into the heart of those whom He desires to give that knowledge to. And we have another... Uh, other ahadith would say that laysa al-ilmu bit-ta'alam Knowledge is not acquired through book learning right? So how do we understand this and put this together? Right? It's a very good question And this is a question um, It's good that you mention it Because by saying that somebody, needs to go to the, somebody wants to go to the Hawza It doesn't mean that somebody who doesn't go Is somehow you know, going to be misguided Or they cannot partake in that light of the Ahlul Bayt That you, we're all searching for This is a very important point to mention let me explain, let me just say in a nutshell, okay, in a nutshell, what we have to make sure that we're doing is we have to do our responsibility for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay? If we are doing our part and we're doing what God wants us to do, then we should be sure that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will reward us with what we're searching for, which is that light and that closer knowledge of Allah and the proximity to the Ahlul Bayt and being in the company of the Ahlul Bayt in this world and the hereafter, like we say in Zarat al-Ashura, that Allah, um, Allah you know, place me with, um, uh, make my life and my death like the life of the, uh, of the And then we say that, um, that in this world and the hereafter, what do we say? That the dunya wal which only my Hussein was having Hussein for dunya wal to this extent. And, and do not separate me from them even a moment in this world and or the hereafter, right? Okay, so. How do we get there? By doing our responsibility Okay, doing our taklif We have to know what our taklif is And we have to act upon this taklif Okay Part of our taklif is seeking knowledge Through traditional and conventional means Alright Because Allah created this world And He put in means for achieving things Right Like if I want to If I want to go out, If I want to get food for myself I have to Go and find an animal and slaughter it Right Or I have to go to the grocery store and buy food I can't just sit here and then to say, okay, Allah, give me that food, give me that food. There's a certain way I need to go about to go out to get that hap make that happen. Similarly, the normal, conventional way of getting knowledge is through studying, right? So, one of the ways of getting that nur and getting that proximity to Allah and the Ahlul Bayt and being among in their company is through studying, right? It's because that's the way that Allah has placed, and that's part of our taklif, right? We're supposed to be learning. We're supposed to be studying, especially when it comes to learning what our responsibility is. And what I mean by, when I mean by studying, when I mean learning, it means either reading books or going to lectures or going to the feet of our scholars and studying with them, taking classes with them. All of these are valid means of learning. And this is a part of our responsibility, wherever we are, 
Okay? But when the Ahlul Bayt say that Laysa al ilmu bi ta'allum, the knowledge is not learning, they're not saying that there's no part of knowledge. I mean, they're not saying that you cannot arrive at true knowledge by learning. No, they're saying that it's not one and the same thing. Meaning that just because somebody learns, that's not all that's there. Because they have to learn, they have to act upon what they learn, and they have to do their responsibilities. Okay? Now let's suppose that somebody um, has been given that opportunity to learn and to learn in an environment like Qum. Okay, they have that, it opened up to them. So they go and they learn, they're doing, the, they're doing the responsibility. Inshallah, if they do that for the sake of Allah and they do the other responsibilities as well too, they will get that nur. Let's say there's somebody else who doesn't have that opportunity. <coughs> Maybe they don't even have time to go and learn above and beyond what the basics are and what the necessary fundamentals are when it comes to ahkam, aqidah, and akhlaq. They don't have time. Maybe it's a mother, for example, who's so busy with the work at home and she's honestly trying, but she doesn't have time to go above and beyond. Once in a while she gets a chance maybe to listen to a lecture or something like that. As long as she's doing her responsibility, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward her with that knowledge, that true knowledge, that light, that proximity. So it's the, the point is that we have to be doing our responsibilities. The, the main course of getting that light is through seeking knowledge, but sometimes we may not be able to do so. Um, and also, just because we do so, it's not sufficient means by which we can be guaranteed that true knowledge which comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I hope that's clear, inshallah. No, yeah? Alhamdulillah. Okay. Yeah, okay. You have to, I, I, my understanding is what, whatever the situation you are going to be, and then also the same time seeking for the light. Uh, exactly. We do our responsibilities and seeking, yes, by doing our duty, um, acting in a balanced sort of way on all of our responsibilities. Um, knowing what they are, acting upon them for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a consistent way, um, then we will see that light inshallah. Yeah. If you want to study a particular area, maybe for a short period of time, is that possible? Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So, um, there's, it is possible through one of two ways that I know of, um, or three ways. Okay, one of them is that you, you go as a visitor, okay, and then you have some contacts by which you set up, you know, a special sort of setting, like you know, the classes and everything, just through personal contacts. And then you go as a visitor on a visitor's visa, and then you go for like the summer or something, like a month or two in the summer, and then you study this thing. Um, the advantage of, advantages of that is that you're free to do what you want. The, but the disadvantage is that um, if you don't have contacts, then it's not going to be a, it's, it's a no go. Another option is that. And then there's a language barrier as well too. I mean, uh, I'm assuming that like, either you know the language or you, your contacts can set you up with English speakers, right? Um, another option is that um, you go and you apply for what's called a fursate mutaliati. Like there's, there's a way that you can apply for a short study of, of doing um, a particular research in some area. And in particular, if there's somebody who, for example, has a master's degree um, or for some reason it has like some compelling type of, 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 of um, qualifications that would make the Hawza look at them and say, Jamal Mustafa look at them and say that, okay, this person is you know, worthy of our attention. Um, they can really like, uh, like, this is actually a very, uh, very viable option. You know, like you can apply, they have a very, it's a very fast application. Relatively speaking, it's pretty fast to get it approved as well too. They'll actually set you up with like housing, with teachers, in teaching English, they'll help you if you want to learn Farsi, they'll help you do that. At the end of the day, you have to produce something, like to produce like a project, like either a, a paper or software or a website or something like that. Um, and the people who are in charge of this, the, the, the head of it is actually somebody who um, has spent like 10, 15 years in London, speaks English fluently, um, Dr. Ilmi. And uh, he seems very open to this. If there are people who are specialized, meaning that they have, they've done something to warrant that special attention, like they've been particularly effective in tabligh or they have a master's degree or, or beyond that, that sort of thing. Um, the third option that comes to mind is the short course program. They have a short course program where you can apply and um, they have different courses on different topics and it's not just like one topic, they have different things. Now I don't know about the quality of them. I've heard praise about them and some of the teachers I know who teach there, they're good. Um, so this is another possibility that somebody could you know, explore this option. Um, yeah. Islamic medicine, um, yeah, yeah, there is, 
I don't know too much about it, but there is this one very famous clinic that's been set up in Qum. It's called Bu Ali Sina Clinic. And I think they have some sort of college or something like that as well too, where they teach people about these principles of traditional medicine. As a foreigner though, I don't know um, really how much access you would have to that because it's a different sort of system. So um, I, I, I wouldn't put hopes on that being some accessible to people. If you have Iran, then maybe. Now, whether it's accessible to women or not, that's another question. You know, that, you know. Sheikh um, Jafar Mahabullah just came, came through. He, um, he, studied, he, he studied some, it seems pretty extensively. On the side? Yeah, with a, a teacher uh, who was a student of Asad uh, Sheikh Asad al Amr. Really? Okay, mashallah. So you might be someone to contact and see what, who that teacher was or what the doctor was. I think uh, the organization Imamia Medics International, um, which is based in U.S., they have some contacts with the group who is conducting these medical-related research. They may be able to provide some information as to what are the possibilities um, of getting involved in some research. Um, on the same line, I have a question regarding um, camps for youths during summertime. Yes. Uh, are there uh, organized activities of, uh, or camps uh, where yeah. they could be, uh, students can spend time? There are camps. Um, the the one that I would recommend, um, that I would, you know, I think it's it's it's, it, it's balanced and it has good people in charge of it, trustable people, um, and they do a good job over, over the years. Is uh, the Al Asr camp, Al Asr. Um, you c it's on the web. You can search for it. It's organized from London, um, and from Qum. Um, I know personally the people in Qum who are in charge of executing it, and uh, often like the pe people like that you know. Like Sheikh Hamza, Sotagar, and others are involved with teaching classes as part of the camp. Um, so uh, I think that's a very good opportunity. It's very good to encourage our, our youth to do that sort of thing. Um, for the U.S. citizens, how uh, easy it is to get visa? Because once I was trying to go for uh, Ziara, yeah. my children uh, who had U.S. passports, they were not able to get visa from here. We had to contact some friends in Tehran. They had to go to the Shah Islami and sign some papers or what what not on our behalf, and then we got the visa for Ziara. Yeah. So for the students who are going for summer camps or other things, uh, yeah. How easy it is to. Students who go for summer camps, that usually is taken care of by the summer camp administration, and they have contacts. They, they've been doing it for for a number of years. They they know how to get it done. You know. Yeah. And uh, they, they tell you, you know, whether we can do it for Americans or not. I think last year they were able to do it for Americans, al -Asr. So when And then when they apply as a group, it's easier for them to get the visas. Mm -hmm. Yes, Brother Bilal? Um, I know you're talking about Jamia al Mustafa, but generally speaking, because of the nature of the house, there's so many differences. How can one ensure that they don't get involved with a group of people who may not be the most straight in that respect, I mean, because, you know, there's a lot of people who teach many different things. Yeah. You just don't want to get caught up with the wrong yes. people. Yes. It's a very good point brother brings up. And inshallah, for those who are going to be going, um, it's a very important point to keep in mind that Western students, for some reason, like, uh, there's been a history where we find a lot of extremism, you know, where um, people come in and they get sort of pulled in different directions. and. It's like more than other um, culture, more than other students from other backgrounds. Like you find that, you know, within a couple of years, for example, like they've totally lost the purpose and they're gone and they're off in, in different things. Whether it be like, um, you know, like weird forms of like spirituality that are, are not endorsed by the Ahlul Bayt and Islam, or whether it be, um, you know, let's say very literal, very narrow interpretations of like, you know, a hadith and Quran. Or whether it be just, just I don't know, political sort of things, you know, other things, right? So it's something that Western students have to be very aware of. Um, maybe there's reasons why Western students in particular are affected by it. But one of the things we have to keep in mind is that yes, that is that there's a general principle that we have is that whenever it comes to like taking a teacher and 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 like going for something, we have to do so on the basis of uh, we have to have proof in front of God as to why we did some did what we did. Right? We have to have. We, I think we have to justify it, right? And so, when it comes to taking our classes, right? If we're doing it outside of Jamaat al Mustafa, the, we should be have, have certainty that this teacher is somebody who is endorsed by the by the system, by the Hausa, by people who are, who are who are reputable, not just by his students, because a student will always endorse the teacher, right? Oh yeah, my teacher is really good. You know, come and join it. No, 
And it shouldn't be we who judge that. Sometimes people say that, okay, I went to his class and I said, he was so inspiring, there's no way that he could be saying anything wrong. That means that if, we don't, if we're not experts in that field, that means that we're making that decision on the basis of our, of our Hawaii nafs, of our, of our, of our passions. Right? Because it's not based on the basis of aql and, and, and ilm, right? It's on the basis of our passions. That's a, that's a wrong approach. We have to go on the basis of, of justifiable evidence, right? And what that means is that it has to be endorsed by the institution. Um, and otherwise, you know, we're, 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 we're going down a slippery, a slippery slope. Um, one of the good things that new students can do is to, to make sure that they um, really spend a lot of time in the company of the, of the senior students. I know Sheikh Rudwan, when he was there, um, he used to really make an effort to try to like bring in the brothers and like to like you know have them come over and talk to them and keeping keeping in touch and alhamdulillah since the time that that he um, you know finished up his studies there and came here those efforts have like increased and alhamdulillah now we we actually have a community of western students so I, I really recommend the brothers who are going there to get involved with that participate in the gatherings don't you know um, some students, some people go out there and say that no, this, you know, whatever they're wasting our time. No, no, go. It's, it, there can be a, a lot of benefit in doing so, and be in the company. Have a few mentors among the senior students who will help you, and and whenever you're making any decisions, be in touch with them. Um, sometimes senior students um, get really busy, and they might not get in contact with you. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't contact them. No, I mean call them up, bug them. You know, always you know be, be in touch with them, and um, I've seen that that's been a very successful way. Um, also, like I said that. We have to work hard to get the classes that we need set up. And if you're taking the same path that others, like when I went to my school, Sheikh Ridwan had set up a special program for himself. I talked to him in detail as to how he got that so I could take the same strategy for myself. And similarly, other students who come in now, um, they should talk to the students who are there to figure out how they can get a special program for, for, program for themselves set up. Essentially, those people in the institution that you know, that you're working with, like Jamal and Mustafa, you just don't want to go outside that. No, sometimes you can go outside, but uh, endorsed by them, in essence. endorsed by them, or, or like you have proof, right? At the end of the day, you have proof in, in front of God that this was a, a choice that I made, and it's a valid choice, right? Like not everyone who who talks, you know, the talk and walks the walk is legit, right? I mean, you have a lot of people out there who are would love to have an English-speaking Western student come and be their student. They would love it. They'll be like, "You come, I'll teach you Arabic. I'll fast track you." Fast track you through all the different sciences within two years. You've been mujtahid, you know, and like I know you've been RF at the same time, right? They love it. Why? Because th it's a it's a big deal. Like I mean, I got this Western student who speaks English in in Qum. That's a big deal. It's it's not very common, right? It can lend a lot to their prestige, right? So they're like hungry eagles waiting to like pounce on their prey, right? So let's not be uh, fodder for these wild beasts, right? We have to. I mean, we, we have to. Let's let's we have to be there, do things in the right way. The other teachers who are there. Um, they'll give everything for you, but they're not after. They're not doing that for like their own personal reasons. They're doing it for the sake of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So we have to go with those guys, you know. Now, how to find them? Uh, it, you know, there's a process involved. Some of the subjects that are taught in the Hausa. Um, okay, so let me just from the beginning. As a foreign student, let's say you grew up in this environment. You're not. You don't have an Iranian background, a Persian background, or if you do, you don't have a very strong connection with the language and all that. What would you do when you go there? So first of all, you'd go and you'd learn the Persian language, um, and then you would study. Um, the introductory studies, like uh, which is like the ahkam, um, the aqaid, the beliefs. Ahkam is the rules, the beliefs, and then the ethics. You know the, the, the various states of the heart, um, and then you would do uh, some history. You would do um, some Arabic language studies. Do do you do some Quranic studies at a basic level? Um, I think that's that's all they have in the Dorda media, right? That's those are the basic subjects that they study. Um, at, a, at, a, at a basic level, but still it's good, it's useful, like, you know, within, so within like, let's say, two years maximum, you have a good, solid understanding of all the basics of the religion. And now you want to go for further studies, um, now what you're going to be doing is you're going to be studying the Arabic language in, in depth, right, when it comes to the morphology, and when it comes to the, um, what is it? Syntax. Morphology and syntax, and the rhetoric, uh, those aspects of the lang Arabic language. You're also going to be studying logic. Um, logic is essential when it comes to um, further studies because you know we need to make we need to establish things on the basis of 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 logical deduction um, of putting together you know things that are, make sense and the basis of truth and truth involves understanding like logical principles so logic is very necessary um, it helps in different sciences and then um, we study fiqh 
uh, which is you know the um, the science of uh, of the um, of of the derivation of the laws of of, of Islam, right? And then there's a, there's a science called usul al fiqh, which is the study of those principles which are used when dri driving laws, right? And then um, we study um, other subjects like philosophy, uh, philosophy to some a certain extent. Kalam, uh, yes, the theology, the, the belief aspect of it, right? The theology, um, and also how we respond to others. You know, how does, how do we, how, what do we think of like, let's say the other, like say Ahlul Sunnah and their beliefs, right? What do we think of like non-Muslim beliefs and how do we respond to some of these common challenges that are faced? Um, how do we explain our belief system on a basis of, of logical reasoning, right? This is another subject that's, sub that's studied in the Hawza. Um, at the end of it, uh, and also akhlaq as well too, you know, like um, both akhlaq when it comes to ourself and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also when it comes to dealing with other people. But at the core of the, the Hawza is very good for um, fiqh and for usul and for um, philosophy. This is sort of like the crown, the crown jewels of the Hawza. Um, and the other subjects that are there that we think we need to study like, uh, like say tarbiyah, child rearing and like, um, I don't know, like... Uh, Various subjects that come up, right? These things are things that you can study on your own once you you have the the grounding. You know, um, the other subject which is good, which is good for, is tafsir to a certain extent. It's good in that as well too. And tafsir is a subject that, that somebody will study in various uh, shapes and forms as they progress through the studies. But the most advanced form of it requires somebody to have completed a number of years of study, and then they can go and, for example, study with Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli and take um, part in his tafsir class, which takes place almost every day. Um, but even along the way, like you can study different um, aspects. Uh, you can study tafsir at a lower level, where you're studying not how to do your own tafsir, but what other mufassirin have said. Teach uh, khitaba as well as uh, uh, like organi organizational skills, management. Do they teach uh, the art of delivering speeches and along with organization skills? Yeah. Um, what they've done now is they have a module, which is a module for those who would like to do tabligh. Okay, because they, they, they don't require every student to do tabligh because maybe there's some students where their responsibility isn't to go back to the community and give speeches and stuff in other countries. Here in America, there's so few people that, you know, it's, it's tough not to do that, right? But, um, so they have a module which if you want to do tabligh, you, ha you have to go through that or you have to, they want you to go through it, okay? And part of that does involve the art of delivering speeches and um, part of that would involve like, you know, various aspects about being a su successful uh, propagator of the faith. You know, and perhaps I would have covered things like management. I haven't studied that myself, but they do cover, I'm pretty sure they cover these topics as well, too, to some extent. Because a lot of, I mean, I, I don't want to say that more of the older generation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I know. Come and it's, you know they, they're they're clueless they when it comes to these things. Than, no, no financial yeah. Skills, yeah. None of that stuff. There's a whole area of development in this called Mudiriyate um, Farhangi. There's been a lot of work in this area, and it is some, one of the subjects which is taught there. And somebody who wants to do research in that, there's opportunities available for them. Can you explain, uh, just, uh, like these things that you're talking about now, they're, they're, they're new. They yeah. People weren't there when I was there. Yeah, just yeah. Can you explain how things have developed and yeah. the direction they're going? Okay. Um, things are... They might wonder, like, why, why don't scholars who are here now, why don't they have these sorts of training, this sort of training? Right, right. Do they not study properly? No, right. Something that's new. Like, so. Yeah, there's, there's a number of new things now. I, haven't, I don't have a list of them to be able to talk about, but some of the trends that I see that, um, that come to mind, one of them is like, the trend of specialization. Okay, like t classically speaking, somebody would go to the Hausa and for years and years and years, everyone would study the same thing, right? Which is Arabic, you know, logic, and then you go for like fiqh and usul, and then maybe some falsafa, and then a little, little bit on the side of kalam, these type of things, and everyone would go through the same thing. And basically the goal would be to get to ijtihad and become mujtahids, and then once somebody became a mujtahid in fiqh and in usul, then if they have time, then they will go and study other subjects in an in-depth sort of way and become mujtahids in those areas as well. Right? And what happened is that they would see that people would start studying and they wouldn't necessarily have enough t years in their life to be able to finish that or they would have to come back earlier and then they would be incomplete because they only saw like half of it. They didn't see the other things that they needed to know um, and, and they're, kind of, they're kind of short and they, 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 they come out short. So what they did is they, they made it so that right now somebody who enters the house within the first two years um, they're going to specialize in an area, okay? And for example, the areas are like Quran and Hadith, or um, philosophy, or um, Shia studies, or history, 
or um, religions or fiqh and wusu. So they choose one of these areas and they specialize in it after the first two years. And then this is sort of going to be their focus. It doesn't mean that they don't study you know, the, the classical studies as well too. No, that's part of the, the studies. But from, the, from up earlier, earlier on, they stud, they're, they're specializing so that they can, the idea is that they can be more effective in delivering to people at an earlier stage rather than having to wait until way lo- later and then uh, being able to be productive and, and deliver at that stage. So this is one area. Now, there's pros and cons to this. Um, I personally believe that as Western students who go there, we have to be careful and not take what they give us and just apply that. But we can take the good things of what they offer us and then ignore the bad things and then do our own things for the other things. There's a way of uh, managing it in a way that's optimal. Um, another thing is uh, that's coming up is um, th- that's been happening is uh, sort of like a a um, like a, a, a great focus on the Quran, like um, of of Quran at all levels. Like there's a lot of emphasis right now and students knowing how to recite Quran beautifully and fluently and a lot of emphasis on like memorization competitions and like recitation competitions um, and not only uh, and tafsir as well too you know like um, it's something that they've uh, I guess it came, came from the leadership like this, this push towards that and so now if you want to for example if you want to get permission to put on the, the dress of, the, of a scholar um, it's not only a matter of what you've studied but there's certain tests that you have to pass certain oral interviews one of them is how well do you recite Quran Right, and then yeah, another. There's been another push, which is that you have to, it's mandatory that you attend akhlaq classes. Um, you have to attend. Like you know, you have to go in and sit there. Um, now, there's some issues about that because when you force something like that, I mean, it shouldn't be something that's forceful. People should be. That should be part of what you're you're there for. I mean, how can you not go? Everyone should be attending at least an hour of akhlaq classes a week, right? But uh, peop- they realize that sometimes people, you know, they're there for the wrong reasons. Remember that. Um, for people who come from other countries, maybe economically speaking, being in the Hausa is like a pretty sweet deal, right? Free room, board, you know, you know, and like, you know, it's like, it's pretty sweet, like, you know. Um, and then you go back and you get perks and all that. So sometimes people are there for the wrong reasons, so, you know, they, they sort of emphasize this as well. Um, what else? No, I meant usul al-fiqh. Usul al-fiqh, which is the study of those principles, that, those shared principles that are used when deriving laws, okay? Um, it has to do with legal, legal legalistic principles. Um, as far as the usul of the deen, which, uh, has, that falls under the, car- uh, the category of aqaid, aqidah, or kalam. And that's studied at one level in somebody's first two years there. They study that. And then um, in the course of their next, first, next three years, they'll study that even more. Um, and then if somebody takes a special speciality of kalam, there's this one special, I forgot to mention that, one, the seventh, a seventh speciality, uh, um, uh, the ma- a major that they can choose is in kalam. They become experts in um, you know, theology. They become theo- theologians, right? Then they'll study the usul al-din even in more detail at that point. They go into it in a deeper level. I have to mention this again, is that like the, the um, I feel like the Western students um, now, see, for the most part, they see themselves as a team of people, not just as like one person, one man show. Classically, historically, uh, a scholar has always worked in his own sort of capacity, right? And the idea of teamwork was foreign. Not that people don't want to work in teams. It's just, that's not part of what they do, right? Uh, but now that's changing. And Alhamdulillah, I think that there's a lot more, there's a feeling of like, of, of like you know, we have a common task. Let's work together. Let's share resources. Let's, um, you know, talk about what's happening like right now, when I'm meeting with brothers um, and mu'minin and hearing the experiences you have to share with me, the problems that you're facing, um, you should know that it, it doesn't just stay with me. Inshallah, if I get the tawfiq, and you know this, this it won't just <laughs> live inside here. Inshallah, I'll be spreading it to other people as well too. And then when they come um, back, they'll have this knowledge already. They'll be armed with this knowledge, and they can come back and um, a lot more prepared to deal with issues that people are facing. You mentioned earlier that there are uh, possibilities or teachers who would not uh, be um, uh, providing or communicating the right things yes. on pe- people. Ma- so is there is, is that not part of the system there or the government to weed out such people? And number two, where does this uh, university, which is formed by Ayatollah Yazdi, form into falls into this educational system for the for the tulab? Okay, um, as far as the first question, um, yes, those people exist, and eventually 
they might get weeded out okay by by the system by the but the thing is that sometimes like th there's a general hesitancy to like to come in and take action until somebody is really proven guilty you know what i mean and sometimes if you look at it the person's not doing something haram all right but the problem is that they're causing this person to become imbalanced mm -hmm. like for example okay like brother joins the hausa all right and then after one year you notice that wait a minute he starts dressing in a funny sort of way his beard starts coming down to like here you know and like he starts talking in a weird sort of way he stops sleeping at night he's always tired you know and he's fasting in the daytime and these types of like you know fake phony types of spirituality you know that this, like this, it's not haram he's not doing anything haram but you know where he's going right and the direction he's taking and then you hear that the second year you hear that okay he's left Qum and then you know, God knows what happened. Like you know, I mean, this is it's, it's it's repeated itself too many times. Like, so um, the point is that uh, it's not always so. They don't take action right away, and it's a big it's a big city, right? It's a you know, I don't know, two million people. I don't know, it's a num lot of people there. Um, you want to mention anything? Yeah, can I ask yeah. I, um, I think that's one of the strengths of the Hosea. It's not a, a fascist system, where where it's trying to um, it's everyone's pro everyone's everyone's programmed in one particular way. It's it's okay. um, like you know, it's passing out robots. Yeah. yeah, it is that way. Each each scholar, a muchtad has has his own ideas, his own his own um, proof to why he believes mm -hmm. certain things and thinks certain things. Mm -hmm. And to a great extent, the Hausa is um, is an extremely diverse place. Mm -hmm. I remember um, Professor Madarasi at Princeton. He once like, he he told me when I was preparing to go, he was like, "You'll find everything from I think he mentioned like everything from an radical and a um, um, something like either democracy um, all the way to like you know fa fascism and like uh, he, he mentioned all these a whole range of political that ideas, economic cool. ideas." And you said you'll find all that in the Hosna. Mm -hmm. That's possible, and part of the strength is not to not to weed it out in an artificial way by you know policing it, okay. but rather allow allowing things to kind of play out and just by it, it's a peer review system where where you know uh, you know mm. people will it'll be, it'll become known that this person is a, a deviant person and this person ha is, is teaching very you know ideas that don't have any basis and that he'll be sidelined naturally. But there are cases where they'll step in as a police force sure. and they say yeah. that this person is really causing facade. And, yeah, and, and, and in this particular thing, they have, they have in some cases, right? But that's later on, you know what sure. I mean? Yeah. And then the second question, Mu'assisa of Imam Khomeini, uh, which was set up by Ayatollah Misbah Yazdi, is, um, plays the role of being like a Hausa slash university that serves, gives degrees to people um, in various areas. And as a foreign student, you can apply to, to, to join that if you want. Um, after like as, as a guy for instance after like three years three four years of study um, and there have been people who have joined that you know um, but in some cases it's not necessary because the same stuff that's being taught there the same teachers in fact a lot of the same teachers come to the other schools you know mm -hmm. so I mean it's easier to be in the foreign school rather than going to that institute because it's like you know like you're with your own people and you get other uh, you get taken care of you get treated like I mean, sometimes there's, there's some things that we need to be it's different different circumstances. So it's like a parallel from. system in some sense. Um, there's a lot of overlap. I think that the, the the like for example the mother the school that uh, Sheikh Ridwan and I, um, you know, go to or have gone to, they, I think they've modeled a lot of what they do off of that school, you know. But that school is primarily for the Iranians, right? And our, this school is primarily for like the foreign students. Uh, but there's overlap. Foreign students go there, and the Iranians come here as well too. Um, the the academic standard there is a little bit higher. But I myself, I went and I participated in the classes um, one term. I, I went to one class. And I wasn't too, I, I, was, I didn't think that, oh, this is so much better than what we have or anything like that. And in fact, it was a, bit, a little bit challenging because there's different cultures at play, right? And if, if you're used to like the foreign student culture and then you walk into a class where everyone's uh, Iranian, then there's a different way that they interact with the teacher. Maybe you're not more com that comfortable with it, you know? But they have some good scholars there, alhamdulillah, and they're doing some good work. Some of the areas that they teach are not taught in the foreign student houses. That's another thing, Sheikh Radan, that, that you asked what's changed. Um, now, f Iranian students can join the, the, the houses of the foreign students, and it, which, which is a new thing that never used to happen before. Mm -hmm. Especially at the master's level and beyond, you have a, a number of Iranians coming and joining the classes. So the, the caliber is going up then because of that. You know, for the most part, it should be. Online classes that you could join, is, uh, they have set up what's called the Imam Khomeini Virtual University. or so It's called Al-Mustafa Universal. I think, yeah, I think it's Al-Mustafa Virtual University. You can search for it on Google. And they have online classes. Um, and they have a lot of infrastructure built in order to like make that happen. Unfortunately, the delivery has been a little bit poor. And um, I've heard frustration from some people outside of 
Iran who have tried to sign up for that and things haven't been as good. But they have a lot of money being poured into that and the person who's in charge of it is actually, um, his name is uh, Hakim Ilahi, Agha, Agha Hakim Ilahi who is in London for five, six years or something. I know he speaks English fluently. Um, and there's hope that that will be set up. I think within the next year, it should be running, inshallah. And they have, they have people who will go and, like some of the good scholars, like, you know, like who will go and record classes in English or deliver them live. And p people can log in from, you know, around and, and they can like learn. And they have different programs. They have like a degree program where you do the studies in a sequential fashion. Um, of course, I mean, that's different than being in the house and studying because of the different things we study. But it's, it can be useful to somebody. They also have like, not a degree program, but kind of like one-off courses where you go and you and take part in something that's of interest, you know. So there's hope there. Um, it hasn't really um, been successful yet on the practical level, but, but inshallah. I mean, and they have, you can go and even sign up, try signing up. Maybe, maybe there's something that you can, uh, even for now, you can take advantage of. You know, they're working hard at it, inshallah. Uh, Sheikh Rudan said that, is it right now, he, when he was there, he felt that the trend was pushing towards book knowledge and ignoring the other type of knowledge. Is this still the, the, the trend? And yes, the answer is yes, um, very much so. And it's become, it's one of the very difficult challenges that we face as students of keeping our attention pure. Let me give you an example. Like suppose that somebody is intelligent. They're, they're clever. Somebody's clever. If you're clever, you can, you can, and you know how to take exams well, you can quickly become a prize, a star student in the Hausa. In terms of, on, in the books, on the books, on the for the record, you can become a, a prize student. And you can be getting, you know, launching through, getting all, 20s, 20 there is like an A plus, right? You can get all A pluses, all 20s, and quickly finish your degrees and go on and get all these different accolades for that prizes, whatever, right? But in terms of what you're there for and the purpose and what it should be, and in the eyes of God, you could have gotten nothing. You could have lost out in the process, but nobody might be there to check you because the system doesn't have these anything built in where you know you're being monitored at a personal level as to how all this knowledge is making you and be, making you become a better person. That's why I mentioned what I did about that we, we have a different mission when we're there. We have to be in touch with these um, authorized guides who can be there and keep us in check. And we're going to visit them on a regular basis and they're giving us advice and pointing us in the right direction, giving us those reminders that we need to, being in contact with the, with the senior students who, whom we trust, who can help us and, and as we're doing this type of thing. Um, and also, uh, I have to say that, e yes, like, that e I've, I've realized that at the... At the for many things, you know, people don't care about that, like, you know, the, the, this other type of knowledge, because whatever, right? But there are some individuals who, who realize the value of that, right? And um, sometimes, like, it, it's behind the scenes, whatever, like, but, like, the, the, like, things happen, like, and there's certain things that will be opened up for students who they know are, are, are concerned about this as well, too. You know, like, they've been there, the officials have been there long enough to know who's there, and it's just treating like university and it's kind of like a joker. He's just going to come in and like, you know, learn their game. And who's there for like the real knowledge, you know? And based on that, they'll, they'll give whatever they need, whatever the student needs and like just, you know, whatever it needs, whether it be spe special classes, uh, opportunities to study, special perks, whatever, because they realize that this is a person who wants to become an alim of the Ahlul Bayt in Islam, that the Ahlul Bayt will be proud of, you know? The other ones, they won't reject, maybe in the hope that in, inshallah one day, you know, that person will wake up and realize, wait a minute, I know all these things, but... I don't know anything, you know. Like I'm, I'm no better off when it comes to my relationship with God than when I entered the Hausa. And then they'll come back. Maybe in, that's, that's the reason why they don't cut them off right away, you know. But the culture is there, unfortunately. We have to be careful about it and not um, fall prey to it. In the beginning, I had mentioned that there's two types of knowledge. One knowledge is book knowledge. Um, what you learn, just like studying. And the other knowledge is knowledge which comes from God, which God bestows in your heart in the form of light and, and knowledge and awareness of God in a presential way. Um, in a way that you can, that you, you, it's something that you can feel and you can experience. So, Sheikh Rulan said that he noticed a trend when he was studying um, which was towards emphasizing the first and not emphasizing the second. Is that still the case right now? He asked. Okay, and my, the, the summary, summary of my answer was that yes, it's still the case. But I was trying to say why that might be the case and how we can avoid falling into that trap should we decide to go and study. May Allah protect us. <laughs> you know, like this is... I'm asking, do you think it's part of the book? Yes, yes, I mean definitely, I mean, 
in the old old days, right, you would be tied with a personal mentor who would kick you out of the hausa if you ever like you know went in this way. I mean like you know that's that's, the, that's the, the philosophy of the hausa is that, that I mean if you show that you have to show, prove like in the times of, of Shahid Bahashti and the hausa he set up, it was a different thing. I mean you had to be a real student, otherwise you're gone, right? And if you showed tendencies of, of doing things this for the dunya, so that for your material, for, to gain money in your pocket, right? You'd be kicked out like yesterday, right? But unfortunately, you know, like some of these things have been sacrificed in the, whatever, maybe because they needed to expand in, in, in like, I mean, they have thousands, thousands of students, right? Um, so we need to take our own precautions, right? And make sure we don't fall prey to that. At the end of the day, we have to worry about ourselves. Alaykum and fusakum. And we should always be suspecting ourselves. No matter what we're doing, wherever we are, we should never be satisfied with where we are right now. Right? We have a hadith um, which says that a mu'min does hisab of himself 70 times a day. Right? 70 times a day, meaning that you take yourself down. Don't assume that, oh, I'm, 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 I'm smooth sailing. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, there's no test for me. Right? Some of these basic things can come and like, you know, um, ruin something, ruin somebody. Right? So, we need to be careful, inshallah, we to do our duty for the sake of Allah. May Allah help us in performing that. Uh, okay. Mutahari uh, have said something very good. He said, in order to uh, water one rose, you have to water so many weeds, you know. Uh-huh. Okay, good. Yeah, Hasan. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's no other way. I mean. yeah. part, of the, part of the purpose of doing, of doing this session was, was, of course, what I said at the beginning, um, to encourage you all, um, whoever is interested, to pass them knowledge about what the hose is about so you can entertain that as one option. But part of it, I think, is also this, that if we realize you know, what, what the Hosa is and um, kind of how, how people study, what kinds of people there are, we realize the reality of it and realize it's not, it's not um, every scholar, every person who wears an imama is not the same kind of person. Mm -hmm. not, it's not a cookie, like a, a cookie factory where everyone cooks on a cookie cutter. Mm -hmm. um, and each, one's, each person is different. As different as each individual of, amongst you is, Every scholar is also different, so depending on how well, he's, how much he studied, how well he studied, what his intentions were, and then all these different factors that go into that making that person, you'll have people who are evil and corrupt, but look very, you know, pious, and you'll have people who, who are just the opposite, who are actually, you know, pious, actually knowledgeable, who actually guide you. Just realize that and, and look at scholars with, with that insight. Realize that I need to evaluate this person. I can't just take it for granted that he must be a great scholar. And he might look like something, but he. And, and remember that we have examples of like the Imam Khomeini and the Ayatollah Bahchad and Allama Tawatabai and, and we shouldn't like despair and say there's no, they no longer exist either, you know? No. I mean, if we see one bad example, it doesn't mean that the whole lot needs to be thrown out.